My name is Freddie. I am the pastor of young adults, and it is my joy to be here with you this evening. We're going to be continuing the series in Hebrews. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, short little four verses. You're welcome to turn there in your Bible or your phone if you brought one. Uh, And while you look for it, I want to tell you about my very first purchase after I had my, you know, first job at 15, 16 uh, I worked in a grocery store uh, and started making a paycheck. I was saving up to buy a car, but it was my money. I could do whatever I wanted. And my very first, like, big purchase was buying a drippy pair of shoes, uh, which I guess that's what you do. I, I grew up immigrant kid. We didn't have a lot of money, so I got, you know, whatever was on sale. Uh, but when I was now big enough to have a job and, you know, saving up for a car and I could buy whatever I wanted, I took... Uh, what felt then like a million dollars, but was actually like just over 150. And I bought a pair of Nike shocks. So we got a picture for you. Yeah, those, I know, those are fire though. Man, what are those, am I right? Uh, those, so this is how fashions change. Uh, those were the drippiest shoes you could buy circa like, 1999, you know, 2005, somewhere in that window, right? And then I bought my pair through a website called Nike ID. So Nike would let you go online and you could select the colorway for every part of the shoe. They made them custom, right? And I was like, biggest flex of all time. I have my own job. I have the drippiest shoes. Uh, And when I first bought them, I only wore them to church. Like those were my church shoes, right? Because I'm like... (laughs) They're not getting scuffed. If, if you did anything that scuffed them, I was throwing hands. Like, they, they cost me an entire paycheck. Like, I, I, this is my greatest possession. Uh, but I had them for a while, and eventually, you know what? I'll wear them to school. What's the point of having drippy shoes if you don't wear them to school? So then I started wearing them to school, but only on days that didn't rain, right? Because I don't want to get them dirty. And then I was like, well, I already wear them to school. Might as well just wear them any day to school, and then I actually, I wear them to school and church, and you know what, I have PE class. They're great shoes, I just wear them for PE class. Uh, and then eventually, I, they just became my outside shoes that I used to kick the soccer ball with our dog. Uh, so what was once my most prized possession, right, the most expensive thing I owned, something that I was the greatest value in my eyes, eventually became something that didn't even come inside the house. It was just in the outside bucket for shoes. Right, this is what happens to all of our possessions. Eventually, every single possession, no matter how valuable, loses its value in our eyes and just becomes bleh, ordinary, outside shoes. Uh, This is not just true of shoes. Uh, If you're a Christian, your greatest possession is nothing physical, but rather this great salvation that you have received, a message about who Jesus is and what he has done. And the first day that we receive that message, it is our most prized possession, and we would do anything to get more of it, and it becomes the thing that we're about. But given enough time, it becomes outside shoes, and it's just something that's there. And the message from this passage is to listen closer to the the call. Listen closer to the call. Now, this passage is a warning, a challenge, an encouragement to people like you and me to listen closely and remain steadfast in the gospel. Uh, there are three points today. The message, the messengers, and the mindset. They don't rhyme. They alliterate. Julie clarified that for me this week. Those are not the same thing, if you don't remember from English 11. So first, the message, Hebrews 2, 1 to 3a. This is the word of God. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? We're obviously in chapter 2, but there's some preliminaries that we have to jump into. So the authorship of this book, you might not know, but is a very contested item in modern scholarship. In the early church, a lot of people believed that it was written by Paul, but it wasn't unanimous. There were things in the letter that made it hard to think this is Paul. 
Uh, primarily, the, this Hebrews contains the highest level Greek in the New Testament. So the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, and this is like the highest version of it. So it would be like reading a, a textbook, right? Like it's Polish language. They don't have run-on sentences. Like whoever wrote it wrote for a living or read a lot of books. And Paul doesn't write like that. Paul was a Jewish guy who learned Greek, but he wrote using Greek words, but he thought like a Hebrew. So and then Paul was famous for run-on sentences. Like, that's, that's his thing. When we try to memorize verses and you try to memorize anything in the Pauline letters, you try to memorize one line, but it ends up being like 16 verses just because they never really have periods. Like, it's just comma, 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 comma. So Hebrews doesn't read like that. So even in the early church, as most people believed it was written by Paul, there were people that said, ah, eh, probably not. But the early church recognized it as Scripture. So eventually, people started to guess uh, who wrote it. And if you look up who wrote Hebrews, you can find like 30 different options. Uh, there are some people who think it was Luke. Luke wrote the book, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. There are people who think it was Barnabas. Barnabas traveled with, with Paul on his first missionary journey. Or Apollos, uh, Silas, another companion of Paul on his missionary journeys. Uh, people just start guessing. They're like, anyone who knew Paul, who like knew Greek, who was part of the New Testament church, they probably wrote it. Male, female, doesn't matter. For the purposes of this series, I'm not too committed to a particular author. Uh, if I had to guess, if you were like, Freddie, who do you think it was? I'd probably guess Apollos, uh, just because I love his name. Uh, no, there's more to it than that. Uh, Apollos is described in Acts, 11, or Acts 18 as a guy who knew, was competent in the scriptures. A guy from Alexandria, which was a Greek city, so he knew Greek. He would have been trained. There was a university in Alexandria. And if he knew the scriptures, he could be the guy who wrote Hebrews, right? If you were here two weeks ago, Josh led us through Hebrews chapter 1, and there are seven Old Testament quotations from a dude who probably carried a few scrolls with him, but they didn't have Google Docs. They didn't have Microsoft Word. They didn't have Google, right? If you wrote things like that, it's because you memorized it. It's because you knew the word deeply, so Apollos checks the boxes. If I had to guess, that's who I'd say, but the important part isn't so much who the author is. The important part is the audience and what was the point of the message. The audience is actually people like you and me. If you read through Hebrews, it's 13 chapters written to people like us, like people who have made a commitment to the Christian faith, but who are kind of wondering, am I fully in? Is this truly for me? I made this commitment a while ago. I made this commitment when I was in youth group. I made this commitment because mom and dad believe this stuff. But now I'm wondering, am I going to follow? This great salvation, this message that I received, is it my most prized possession? This book is very relevant for us because there are so many parallels between us today and the audience of this book. People who are wondering, should I stay in the Christian faith. And the author of Hebrews says, yes. That's what our, our little passage here, these four verses are all about. Uh, his entire point is to teach us about our great salvation and then do so by talking about Jesus. Jesus is better than everything else. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than David. Jesus is better than Aaron. A whole bunch of Old Testament characters, a whole bunch of Old Testament stories. So as we jump into the rest of the sermon and the rest of the series, Right, we're just uh, we're approaching it from the position that whoever it was that wrote it, they were writing God's words to people like us, so that we would continue in the faith. And as we work through the book, some things start to stand out. Chapter one, if you were here again two weeks ago, was all about Jesus. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is greater. And all of that led to. Our passage here, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. And if Hebrews kind of reads like a sermon, then the structure of the letter would be, chapter 1 is kind of your introduction. Introductions gain your attention, right? They pull you in. It starts talking about Jesus. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. I'm interested. Tell me more. And then a bunch of Old Testament quotes that make it clear that this isn't just a made-up thing. Jesus is the point of human history. And then in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, we get the thesis, right? What's the point of the sermon? What's the big idea? And the big idea of the sermon is to not neglect this great salvation. So then we have to ask the question, uh, what is the great salvation? 
this great salvation that we must pay closer attention to, according to verse 1. The short answer is what God has done through Jesus to save sinners. Like That's salvation. That's how Christians define it. But the long answer would be uh, a little bit deeper, I think. Right? The long answer would be something more like what God has done in Old Testament history past and leading up to the person of Jesus in the present to save sinners. Right? There's a little bit more narrative involved. And I'm going to give you a very truncated, very shortened summary of Old Testament history in the form of three Old Testament offices, three Old Testament roles, or three Old Testament jobs, if you will. Prophet, priest, king. And each one of these is going to be addressed later on in the book of Hebrews. But at this point, they just give us a picture of the great salvation that the author of Hebrews is speaking about. So prophet, priest, king, these were all Old Testament roles. If you aren't familiar with the language, uh, they were just jobs that were given to specific people in the people of God. So imagine with me that you're on a construction site. You're at a construction site, and the, the, there's a foundation, but everything else still has to get built, right? It, there is more than one skilled trade that shows up, right? If you've never been to one, the way it works is the, the framers come through, and they, like, build the actual structure of the house. Uh, but if that's all you had, just studs and a roof, uh, that would not be enough. So then there are people that come through and do like the other skilled trades, so like plumbing and electrical. Uh, and then you get kind of the finished stuff, right? Like cabinets and drywall and painting and flooring and tiling, all kinds of things. So to go from just a house or just a foundation to the actual house, you need a bunch of different people with a bunch of different jobs coming through and doing their job effectively. The people of God living with God required a bunch of different people with a bunch of different skills doing their job effectively. And there were three specific jobs that people in Israel had. There was a prophet, there was a priest, and there was a king. Multiple prophets, priests, and kings over the years, but there was always someone that fulfilled each one of these roles. And Hebrews' whole goal in this entire letter is to show us that each of these offices, each of these Old Testament jobs, is, finds its climax, or finds its fulfillment in Jesus as he does the job better than the most famous version of that Old Testament job. So I'll give you three quick examples. If I, if I had to be you know, asked, who are the three most famous prophet, priest, king from the Old Testament? In my mind, the answers are pretty simple. Moses, Aaron, and David. Right? There's three Old Testament characters, so I'll explain to you why I think each one is the most famous. So in terms of prophet, Moses is the most famous prophet because prophets had one very basic job. They spoke the words of God. And Moses is the guy who met God face to face on Mount Sinai thousands of years ago and then wrote on a piece of stone the words of God. If there was a person who represented this job, speaking the words of God, it was Moses. Right? Moses famously led the people out of captivity in Egypt, wrote down the laws of God, and then we're told in Deuteronomy 18, he prophesied that one day there would be another prophet even greater than Moses. This is what it says. I will raise up for them a prophet, this is God speaking, like you, like you, Moses, from among their brothers. So there will be a prophet like Moses, who is not Moses, but who is part of the Jewish people. And I will put my words in his mouth. This is what prophets do. They speak the words of God. He shall speak to them all that I command him, and whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. What God is saying in this passage is, I expect obedience, that's why I speak, and there is going to be another prophet. So Moses is great, but there's going to be someone even greater. And Hebrews is going to go on to make the argument, Jesus is that greater Moses. Uh, it continues, Aaron, most famous priest. Aaron was the very first high priest. In the Old Testament, the high priest's job was really simple. They gave sacrifices to forgive people of their sins so they could be close to God. Right? God is the kind of God who is holy, who is perfect, who is righteous. And when we sin, when we break God's law, when we act rebelliously, God wants to hold us accountable. God has the right to hold us accountable. And priest's job was to forgive us of our sins. They would offer a sacrifice and the people of God would be forgiven. So in Leviticus chapter 8, we read about Aaron being consecrated, being prepared for this job of every single year he would offer sacrifices 
to forgive the people of their sins. So this is that scene of Aaron being prepared for his job. Then he presented the other ram, the ram of ordination. Moses is doing this. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram, and he killed it. And Moses took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. Then he presented Aaron's sons, and Moses put some of the blood on the lobe of their right ears, on the thumbs of their right hand, and on the big toes of their right feet. And Moses threw the blood against the sides of the altar. Sacrifices are a pretty crazy thing, but they're a very normal thing for the ancient people of God. And what is happening in this scene is that Moses kills an animal, and that animal represents the, the death that sin deserves. And then he takes the blood and he says, this is your job. You are going to be the person who represents us before God. And not just you, Aaron, but your sons, because there will need to be always someone representing us, forgiving us of our sins. So there is a, a prophet like Moses, a priest like Aaron, and then maybe most famously, a king like David. David was like the, the highlight of Old Testament history. He was the most famous king who was the greatest warrior and, you know, the most beautiful poet. And he led the people of Israel into tremendous victory. And he led them in 40 years of prosperity. And in that season of prosperity, God spoke this promise to him from 2 Samuel 7. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will build the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. What God is saying to David is, you're going to have a son, and this son is going to be an even greater king than you, and then he'll have more sons because his throne will be forever. In the Old Testament, you have a foreshadow already. Uh, Moses is a great prophet, but there's going to be someone greater. And Aaron is a great high priest, but his sons must follow because he's not going to do the job forever. And David is the highest king, but he'll have a son whose throne will extend forever. Old Testament history was, as it was unfolding, was pointing forward to something else. And the author of Hebrews grabs onto all of these things and says, all of Old Testament history was pointing forward to Jesus. This great salvation, what God has done in Old Testament history and leading up to Jesus to save sinners, all of it can be summarized through these three offices, the prophet, the priest, and the king. Jesus is the all-in-one, if you will. He's a three-in-one. Uh, I'm a guy, so I use classic three-in-one, like, you know, Old Spice. I, girls have, you know, obviously you know, you have like hair stuff and conditioner stuff and then like defrizzing stuff like I'm married so I go into the bathroom and I see six bottles of things and I'm, I don't even know what they all say but I know my wife uses them because every three months we spend another $400 on whatever it is that she uses but it's worth it she has beautiful hair so it's worth the investment uh, but I'm not that you know I'm like I'm a pretty simple guy I go to Costco and whatever they have is what I buy and I buy the three-in-one it's like face wash, shampoo, conditioner, body wash, lotion, right? It does the dishes for you. It's everything in one, right? It's the three in one. It has everything that I need so I smell nice and am clean. Uh, Jesus is that. Jesus is the three in one. He has everything you need so that you smell nice before God and you are cleansed of all your sins. He is the prophet, priest, and king all wrapped up in one person. The Old Testament story shows us what God's people needed. And then Jesus steps in and says, I can do that perfectly. Everyone else needed to do it over and over again, but I'm going to take care of things once and for all. And as, as we keep going through the book of Hebrews, this will become exceedingly clear that Jesus is the prophet who once and for all teaches us the words of God that we have in the Bible. Uh, that Jesus is the priest who cleanses us of our sins, not in a sacrifice that he gives over and over again, but in a one-time sacrifice on the cross. And Jesus is the king who leads us into obedience, not for 40 good years, but for our lifetime, right? Amen. Jesus is the three in one. When Hebrews says to pay closer attention to this great salvation, to not neglect this message that we have received, this is what he has in mind. This Old Testament history, all pointing forward to the person of Jesus, 
So if this message had to be heard, it had to be received, it must not be neglected, then I think this passage starts with a challenge, a warning even, that you cannot let this message just go by you. This can't be your outside shoes that just are junk. This is the most important possession you could ever have. This message that is declared to you of hope, of life, of salvation. This passage carries a warning in verse 2 that there is just retribution for those who deny it. And this is the Christian story. Eternal life is offered, but there is an expiration date on that offer. So a passage like this, I think, challenges us to accept this message, to believe and respond to the message that there is a God, and this God is reaching out to you. This God has done something through the person of Jesus to save us of our sin. That is our fundamental human problem, that we all are going our own way. And when 8 billion people are doing their own thing, it doesn't work out. So what we need is we need someone to forgive us of our sins and then teach us how to live. And Jesus says, I'm going to do that. I'm going to die for your sins. I'm going to resurrect so you can have new life. And I'm going to teach you how to live. And then he makes an offer. Come and follow me. So the question for us this evening is, have you responded? Have you accepted this great salvation that is offered to all people? And if you haven't, you should. Tonight should be the night where you accept this great salvation. People can only learn of this great salvation, though, if someone tells them. Which brings us to our second point, the messengers. Hebrews 2, 3 to 4. It was declared, this message was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. I've already made it clear that I think that this great salvation is the message of salvation, right? That this, the story of Jesus, where the Old Testament story led forward to what Jesus accomplished, and all of that together is something that cannot be neglected. It's something that must be received. And we're told here in our passage that there are three different messengers of this story. The Lord, the people who heard it, or the apostles, and God himself, actually, the Holy Spirit. So when, when you want to tell someone something, the more witnesses you have, the more likely it is that what they're saying is true. Now, this is not obviously always true. Sometimes multiple people can lie. But statistically, it is more likely if you have multiple people saying the same thing that what they're saying is actually true. So for example, if I told you that tonight we have a delicious snack after the service of samosas, or we were supposed to, But then Michaela dropped, you know, fumbled the bag and knocked over the cart and they all fell in the parking lot. And now we have no snack tonight. Uh, You would probably be a little hesitant because you're like, I know Michaela. She's a very capable girl. That's probably not what happened. But if then Julie said, actually, I saw it. I saw the cart fall over and I saw all the samosas on the ground. Then you'd be like, well, Freddie might make fun of Michaela, but Julie wouldn't. Julie tells the truth. And then if Josh said the same thing, You'd be like, okay, maybe it's more likely. And then Kira and Maddie, you're like, wait a minute. Like, these are all the people on stage. These are all the people on leadership. Like, I think that probably did happen. You wouldn't know, obviously, but you're trusting the messenger. You're trusting that the more witnesses I have, the more likely it is that what they are saying is true. And that's exactly what Hebrews is saying. There are more messengers, so this message is more likely to be true. Accept it. Believe it. But as we go through each messenger, we have to make the decision, like, is what they're saying true? So the very first messenger of the story of Jesus is actually Jesus himself, right? So if there's one person you want to believe it from, it's the guy who's claiming to be the the fulfillment of prophet, priest, and king. So when we work through the Gospels, we learn very quickly that Jesus came to preach. Like, that's what he came to do. And not just, like, general statements about let's, let's love people and be really nice, but very specific statements that invited people to follow him. So I want to show you. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. After John was arrested, so John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. So already he's telling a message. What's this message? The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. If there is a kingdom, 
There must be a king. And Jesus is saying, I am that king. He's not using the language of the prophetic office, the priestly office, the kingly office. He's simply claiming the kingdom is here. Repent, so turn and believe and follow me. I am that king who is breaking this kingdom into the world. And then as you keep going in Mark chapter 1, you would read in verse 38. And he, Jesus, said to them, let us go to the next town so that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went throughout all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. So Jesus continued to teach people, saying the same thing. Repent, change your ways, and follow me. Believe in me, right? Become one of my people. Become one of my followers. And then we're told in, in, towards the end of the chapter, he also casted out demons. He showed himself to be powerful. He showed himself to be a prophet who could speak God's words. A king who could lead God's people. And then as he frees people from oppression, a priest who could forgive us. Jesus was acting in all three of these offices. He's the first messenger that we encounter. But Hebrews goes on. He's not the only messenger. There were also people who first heard the message. Uh, what in the New Testament is called the apostles. These were the people that walked with Jesus for three years. And they knew Jesus. They heard him preach. They ate meals with him. They slept in the same room. They followed him everywhere. They knew who this man was. They knew who he claimed to be. And through these apostles, the message of Jesus was spread. Right? This, is, this is what they were meant to do. When we look through the book of Acts, which records the spread of this message, right, all around the, the Mediterranean world, this is the way that the apostles describe their own ministry. So Acts chapter 5, Peter and John reflecting on what it is that they do. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, right? So resurrection, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree, right? Which is just a Jewish way of saying cross. So Peter is reflecting on the historical event. Jesus died on a cross, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to do what? To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Forgiveness of sins, priestly language, leader, right? So king, right? And savior, Someone who can teach the people how to live. Repentance, forgiveness of sins. All of these words together show that the apostles, they didn't use the language of prophet, priest, and king, but they understood Jesus to have fulfilled all these roles or have completed all these tasks. And their duty was what we see in verse 32. They were witnesses. They told people, this guy, what he claimed to be, it was true. He died and he resurrected. So we know he was who he said he was the prophet, the priest, and the king who leads God's people, who teaches us God's words and forgives us of all of our sins. This Jesus is worth following. Believe in him. It's not just Jesus who shares this message. It's not just the apostles. It's also the Holy Spirit. In this passage, the Holy Spirit is the third messenger. And the Holy Spirit was given as this third messenger to kind of verify what was already said. If Jesus already claimed it and the apostles are saying the same thing, then what you want, like if you want the cherry on top, is you want someone else kind of proving it. And if the apostles who are claiming Jesus is God are then able to do miraculous works in the name of Jesus, it would give us the impression that in fact Jesus was God. So the Holy Spirit came and gave them the power to do miraculous works. Right, the Holy Spirit is acting like the, you know, the verification that the message is true. Right, so if, if you're on Twitter, you know, they have these community notes, or X, I guess, formerly known as Twitter, where when someone claims something, there'll be the little like, box underneath that says this has been fact-checked by independent fact-checkers, and they'll like, check the veracity of whatever it was that was claimed. The Holy Spirit functions in that way. If there is a man going around named Peter or Paul who claims, hey, Jesus is the prophet, priest, and king who leads us and guides us and teaches us and saves us from our sins, and then they do something tremendous in the name of Jesus, you would feel, you would feel compelled to believe the message. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, in passages like Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are walking into the temple or into the synagogue. And as they're walking in, they see a, a blind guy or a, a, a lame guy who is asking for money. 
And Peter's like, I, I have no paper, but what I have, I will give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the dude gets up. So you're like, man, this Jesus must be pretty powerful. A few chapters later, Acts chapter 16, Paul is walking into a city and this girl is following them around and just chirping them because they follow Jesus. And Paul gets super annoyed. And he's like, I, in the name of Jesus, demon, come out of her. And the demon does. So you have miracles performed by these apostles to prove that what they claimed was true. This is what Ephesians 2 says about the work of the apostles. Speaking to the church, uh, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So the people of God together are a family built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. The work of the apostles was to share the message in the same way that prophets shared God's word in the Old Testament and by so doing, invite more and more people to join the household of God, to say, I'm turning from my ways. I'm actually gonna follow this Jesus. I think he is who he claims he is. I think he can do what he claims that he could do. In our passage here in Hebrews chapter two, we see that this message of great salvation is proclaimed to all people. And we see it comes through the messenger of, of Jesus himself, through the apostles, and through the Holy Spirit. Right? This great salvation is spoken to all people so that we could respond. Which brings us to our third point, the right mindset. Hebrews 2, 1 to 4. We're going to read it again one more time all together just to bring it to a close here. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. Our passage, as I said before, opens with a warning, right? Pay closer attention, or you won't escape if you neglect. And then a command, actually, the, the pay closer attention is the command it opens with. But there's a word that we kind of glossed over because it's one tiny word in English. Uh, the word must. So pay much closer attention is the command, but the word must precedes it. And the word must shows up to us in passages uh, elsewhere in Scripture, and it, de it describes something that will take place, something that God has predetermined to happen. So this word shows up in Luke chapter 24 when Jesus describes his own ministry. So in Luke 24, the disciples are like, there's two disciples walking with Jesus, and they're like, we don't understand why all these things had to happen, which sometimes happens to us. We don't understand why things happen. We don't understand who Jesus claimed to be. And Jesus says to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary? So necessary is the key word. So this had to happen. The Christ should suffer and these things and enter into his glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So again, Jesus appeals to the Old Testament history saying, I'm the fulfillment of the prophet, of the priest, and of the king. And this all had to happen. This was always the plan. And in the same way that it was always Jesus' plan that he would die and resurrect, the author of Hebrews tells us, it is God's plan that you would pay closer attention to the salvation you have received, to the great salvation message that you have heard. I think this passage challenges us because the reality is we, we don't always pay attention to the message. Right? And it is explicit that this message is proclaimed to us over and over again. Uh, we've heard this message in verse one. It was declared by the Lord in verse three. It was attested to by those who heard, right? The apostles said the same thing. God bore witness. The Holy Spirit proved that it was true. Over and over and over again, we're told, this message was shared so that you would believe it. This passage challenges us to then believe it, to, to respond, I think. Uh, what should we do when we receive clear instructions? The answer is pretty simple. You listen to the clear instructions. 
Uh, I've already mentioned I have a wife, and we have a couple of kids. And my wife, when she gives me instructions on how she wants particular things done with the boys, will give me very specific instructions. So my youngest son likes Yop yogurt cups, or little yogurt bottles, if you've ever had one. They're kind of gross. Uh, but he doesn't, he's too little to drink it, and he'll just spill it everywhere. So he likes it with a straw, but then we have silicone straw, so he doesn't slice his face open. And the silicone straw has to be inserted by cutting the bottle in a particular way. So when my wife was teaching me the appropriate way to give August a Yop yogurt drink, uh, she was like, Freddie, are you paying attention? I'm like, no, yes, I'm listening as I'm scrolling on my phone. Uh, and then she's like, no, no, like you cut the bottle in this direction and it can't be flat because it'll cut them, right? So you want a little bit of an angle so that there's no like sharp edges on the bottle. And I'm like, totally, totally, not even looking at her, right? Uh, and then you take this silicone like straw because he likes this color. Which color does he like? And I'm like, uh, the one you're holding. She's like, no, which color does he like? The yellow one. Okay, and you put the yellow straw in the yop and then you give it to him, yeah? I'm like, uh-huh, I give it to the kid, right? If I am paying attention to the instructions that I received, right, what is the clearest evidence that I'm paying attention to these instructions? If I do exactly what I've been instructed to do, right? If I then cut the yacht bottle in the right way and I put the yellow straw in it and then give it to the kid at the right time, then I've shown myself to have understood the instructions because I listened to them. Hebrews 2 gives us clear instructions, You need to pay closer attention. You must pay closer attention to this message that you have received. So the evidence that you and I are paying attention to these instructions to cling to this message is if we actually obey it. And the way we know that we are obeying it is if we are obeying or following Jesus. And following Jesus is a life, ultimately, of obedience Uh, Obedience is a present tense verb. It's something that we do in the moment and in an ongoing process. This passage challenges us in that the right mindset is that we would have a life of obedience. This is like one of my favorite verses to describe this is Luke 6.46, which teaches us how foundational obedience is to the Christian faith. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? The reason this message is proclaimed, the reason that we are exhorted, commanded, you must pay closer attention to this message, is that we would be the kind of people who not just say, Lord, Lord, but who actually obey the things that Jesus says. The Christian mindset is a life of following Jesus, of living like he lives, of talking like he talks, of thinking like he thinks. So I want to end with a few challenging questions. Uh, First off, are you living in obedience to God's word? This is what the point of instructing us to lean in, to pay closer attention to the message is. And the the passage does include warnings of not neglecting, of not drifting. So are you Christian? Are you drifting? Are you selective in your obedience of God's word? There's some things you like and some things you like a little less and you're just drifting. Or worse, Christian, are you neglecting? Are you living in persistent disobedience to what Jesus calls us to do? This passage reminds us, pay attention to the message and if we pay attention, we do what we're instructed to do, which is obey. The Christian mindset is a life of obedience, a life of hearing the message, accepting it from the messengers, and responding in obedience. These three things are the whole point of the book of Hebrews. And as we keep going through this entire book, we're going to circle back to this same message over and over again, that hang in there, stay true to this Christian faith. Uh, Returning to my Nike shocks, and the shoes that I once loved, uh, I have no idea what happened to them. They became my outside shoes, and eventually I think they just ended up in the dumpster uh, because they were just okay. And as I was looking through my photo roll trying to find a picture of them, I couldn't even find a picture of them. Uh, and I remember the day I first bought them. You know, I had to borrow my dad's credit card because I didn't even have a credit card because I was only 15, and I had to like punch in the numbers, and it was my first online purchase, and I'm spending all of my money, and on these shoes, because they're the most important thing. And within a matter of years, 
They're just in a dumpster somewhere, never to be seen again. So often, Christian people jump into the Christian journey, and they have so much joy at the beginning. This message is the most important thing I've ever heard. This is the greatest possession I've ever held, this message that I've received. But a number of years, it loses the wow, and it ends up in a dumpster somewhere. My challenge to you this evening is to listen closer to the call, to listen closer to the message of Jesus, and to continue to walk with him. I'm going to pray for us, and I'll invite the music team back up. Father God, thank you for this passage that both includes an encouragement in the fact that there are many messengers, your son, the apostles, and the spirit that give us the message of this great salvation. Uh, But also, thank you, Father, for the warning that reminds us that this message is not just something that is meant to be heard, but it's meant to be received and obeyed. So, Father, I pray for every person here, for those who have never received the message, that tonight would be the night that they receive it. And for those who have received this message but are now wondering, am I going to continue? Am I going to walk with Jesus all of my days? Father, I pray that they would see the value of this great salvation, the exceeding joy and wonder of walking with you. Father, we know that as we walk with you, we are never alone. So I pray for endurance for every Christian here that we would persevere in the race. Father, you've helped us this far. We pray that you would help us into the end. In the name of Jesus, we ask, amen.